Let's get into the top 100. 100 to 86 is the numbers that we're going through today. And of course, you can follow along with the link in the episode description, uh, which as always, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing that through every single one of these episodes. And if you're on YouTube, you'll, you'll see the list right there as we're sharing the screen and going through it. And of course, when we're done with the top 100, we will do the just missed because I know that's always a question like who just missed uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up with that as well. But at number 100, this was a, uh, a Jack McMullen push. Uh, this was one that you know, we were at the gas station and you're like, all right, now that we have a moment, um, I, I, I'm going to need you to, to watch more Hurston Waldrop. And you just kind of forced me to watch more Hurston Waldrop, more Hurston Waldrop, more Hurston Waldrop. And I appreciate you doing that because I'll give the whole out, outlook and then you fill in, fill in, you know, kind of the blanks here for the Braves first round pick in 2023. I mean, stuff wise, you can understand why he's a first round pick. And even though he was under slot at the 24th overall pick, you know, he was roughly late first, early second type of, of, of grade for him. I think that's where most were expecting him to go. Braves love drafting these types of guys to late in the first, especially if they can save some money. The numbers aren't nearly as good in the minor league or excuse me, in college baseball as, as you would expect for a guy with his, with his stuff. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with his splitter and has nothing to do with his slider. His splitter is a double plus pitch. His slider is, is a pitch that already flashes plus, especially after he scrapped the curveball. My concern were, were two things. And you know, this is what we talked about. The fastball You'll see plus grades out there, and I get it from a velocity standpoint, but the shape, it's not good. Um, it, it is pretty just just straight as could be. Seems like hitters pick it up really easily. And, I mean, you had college hitters, despite it being upper 90s, hitting over three, well over 300 against it. Then in his pro debut, continued well over 300 numbers, uh, not very good whiff rates. And then the command is the question. So you have fastball quality and command. Why do those things, I'm not going to say why, why do they not matter? Of course they matter, but why are they not so concerning that he's not a top 100 prospect, Jack? Because he throws in the mid to high nineties with his fastball. And it does feel like in good organizations, fastball command is one of the easier things to teach nowadays. So you're banking on a guy learning fastball command. And even if he doesn't, he's got a splitter and a slider that could slot him into high leverage moments for a team that wants mm -hmm. to win the World Series this year. Yeah. So that's why. Like he is Matt Brash in a nutshell. And yeah. hindsight's 2020. Like I think everybody going into the 2022 season would have had Matt Brash on the top 100, knowing that he could turn into what he has turned into. We had him. Yeah, we had him. And like the thing is, you knew that he could fall back on being an elite reliever. And guess what? Like he yeah. is an elite reliever. That was the fallback plan. Hurston Waldrop is very similar to the Brash and DL Hall cut where you've got no idea where it's going sometimes, but it's so gross. And I showed you like how ridiculously over the top that guy is. He's a freak athlete that somehow gets on top and that splitter might be the best North South pitch in the minor leagues. Uh, I'm with you. I, I mean, it, when we talk about the numbers too, it was arguably the best pitch in college baseball. I mean, you got the Skeen slider and and of course the Skeen's fastball just because of how he overpowered guys, but that splitter, I mean, no one could hit it, but then he put up the same numbers in, in the professional ranks too. That always is, you know, something that you want to see right away, right? Like, is it going to dominate to the same clip, especially with a guy that, you know, has to mask the fastball a little bit. I, I love the point you bring up about the, you know, the delivery and he's so athletic. And that was another thing that you pointed out. It's like you, you figure he can maybe find a way to backspin the baseball a little bit more, get a little bit more ride to it. Maybe he leans into more of a, a cut ride. And if he does that, cause that's where the, it, it's closest to is, is, is that cut ride shape, but it just doesn't have the cut. So right now it's just, it's just kind of flat. Like it just doesn't really have enough life to it. It's almost like a cutter that doesn't cut. Um, so if he can lean into that a little bit more, you know, that, that could be something that helps the fastball. But you mentioned like if the command gets better, if you're lo locating 95 to 97, it's not going to get bludgeoned because it's still hard. The problem is uh, right now it's it's the shape and then he's missing over the middle a lot. He's falling behind in counts. He's got to go back to the fastball. There's a lot more hitters counts. And I think that makes the fastball play worse than it than it maybe is, is because he's falling behind in counts. You have guys that have that fastball that's a get out of jail free card because it's okay. Yeah, you know, the fastball is coming, but this is an invisible. You're not going to hit it. He's not like that. So if he's not getting ahead of hitters, it only exacerbates the issues with the fastball. Well, and the thing is, he does have a get out of jail free card. It is the splitter. Yeah. So like 
while it's not the pitch that he can turn to 60% of the time, That's it the is a pitch that like, hey, when shit hits the fan, just splitter, 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 you can get out of pretty much anything. 100%. And I love the brash comparison because I think his floor is really high leverage reliever, swing man, just Swiss army knife type. Uh, but I think there's a great chance that he settles in as a volatile starter. Uh, yeah. and, and that's that's why he's the top 100 guy. But the volatile, the volatility is is why he's at the 100 spot. Mm-hmm. The opposite of volatility is number 99. Uh, and it's Enrique Bradfield Jr., the Baltimore Orioles, a guy that when we went through the Orioles system, I told you just the more I dug in, the more I, I, I just he grew on me offensively because hey, look, it, there's there's minimal impact. It was a disappointing junior season from him at Vanderbilt when you look at look at it from an offensive perspective. But he's. I mean, right there, I think aside from Pete Crow Armstrong, I think it's it's him and Victor Scott that are like right there as you know two A and two B as the best defensive center fielders out there. And you know, there's there's a chance that Bradfield could end up being right there with PCA too. I, I think he's got can do a lot of the same things that PCA does, just doesn't quite have that arm that PCA adds to the fold as well. Uh, but having the the great bat to ball having the elite feel for the strike zone, like he borders on passive, but I'm okay with guys like Bradfield being passive. I don't want Emmanuel Rodriguez to be passive because you got to do damage. You got to swing to do damage yeah. with Bradfield. It's like single walk, kind of the same thing. You can go deep and count, spoil a bunch of pitches and just grind. And, and it's, it's okay for a guy like Bradfield to be passive. So that's what he does. And he's good at it. We saw him in the spring breakout game, lay down a bunt and he could have backpedaled to first base. Like, it, those are the things where it's like, he's going to be able to just, like scheme his way into a, a solid on base percentage, even if he doesn't hit a ton. Yeah. Uh, the power is obviously going to be well below average. He, he may have seasons where he doesn't even hit a home run, but I still see some room in that frame. Like he's he's got some he's got some broadness to him. Like he, he's 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 skinny, but there's a bigger like wider frame. So if, if he can put on a little bit of weight, you know maybe there's a little bit more impact there, and it can be more gap to gap. But when you have 80 run, a guy that can steal 100 bags, you have elite defense in center field, the ability to walk and good bats a ball. Like he may never make an all-star game, but he's such a high probability big leaguer that he's a top 100 prospect. So we beg 80 runners to get on base. That That is the whole idea behind an 80 run tool. Can you get on base at a clip over 310? Estiori Ruiz had a 309 OBP last year and he swiped 67 backs. It's the Billy Hamilton conundrum, man. It's like, Every 80 runner, it's like, are you going to get on base enough to be valuable? No with Billy. Seemingly no with Ruiz. And like 67 bags is a ton. And he's a big leaguer. But like he could be an all-star if he got on base at a 350 clip. Bradfield seems like the type of 80 runner that can get on base at a 350 clip. His I- college OBP in his career, and like obviously it's it's college, so it's going to be drastic, but a 426 OBP. His first 25 games in the minor leagues, a 473 OBP. His 11 game sample out on the Cape, a 348 OBP. He hit under 200. He's yeah. always getting on base. So if this guy can be a 350 OBP guy, his value skyrockets. I love that you brought up Hamilton and and Ruiz because both of those guys did not have great approaches at all, or still don't. Like Ruiz, it's it's not great. Uh, they're aggressive. They would swing a lot, and that happens with the speedy guys. It's almost counterintuitive, uh, but they have such a good field to hit. They think they can get to anything. Let me slap it on the ground and run. Yeah. I mean, these big league infielders, man, even if you fly, they will get you out. They're quick. They got rockets for arms. They know how to play you. They know your spray charts. Y- you can't just do that as much. Uh, so the fact that he can walk a ton helps. You know, that mitigates the I'm just going to slap a ground ball, you know, one Oh count and, and ground out. So that helps a ton. And then I just think he's a better hitter than those guys. I really do. I think there's just more offensive upside there than those guys, especially Billy Hamilton, but uh, Ruiz as well. I mean, it's just a much more advanced bat at, at this stage. And I think there's the bat is just more projectable in general, just from the contact standpoint and the approach. So I feel really good about him being a big leaguer. And if he's an OBP machine, makes enough contact, which we know he's going to do. It's a, it's a borderline plus hit tool at this point and plays elite defense. He could back into three win seasons. It's yeah. like, I think he can be everything that the guardians were hoping miles straw would be when they gave him the contract. Yeah. Cause miles straw is great. bat to ball. Uh, I, I think it's that elevated version of that. Like the, the good year that we saw from miles straw is, is kind of what I see Bradfield settling in as. And that's a top 100 prospect in baseball. While miles straw is making four and a half mil to play for the Columbus Clippers which is crazy, crazy. 
again, we're just like kind of shifting to a different type of player now, which is it makes these lists so this is why these lists take so long. Cause I got to compare Jacob Melton of the Houston Astros to, to Enrique Bradfield Jr. Jacob Melton, we actually got a chance to see uh, an additional time, which was nice in, in a big league spring training game. And, and I thought he looked pretty, pretty damn good there, even though the, the numbers were not great for him in, in, in big league spring training. He did get a fair amount of run with the Astros. Second round pick in 2022. He was a top 100 prospect at the end of the 2023 update. He did fall a little bit just because of some hit tool concerns that I just continue to come to light. The more you know, research I did this off season, you know, just the, the more I watched and, and dug in. But at the same time, he did make some adjustments this off season that I think could help him. But what makes Melton so fun is he hits the living crap out of the ball. Like he's strong. 90th percentile of 107. I don't think anybody would wow. expect from him. He can play a good center field. He can fly. What was it? How many stolen bases last year? 50, 46 in 40, 53 attempts. Motors. He needs to cut down on the chase a little bit. Something that he improved as the year went on. I think there was one note I had in this write-up, which was uh, – he got better against breaking balls as the year progressed and, and the contact rate started to get better as well. He cut the chase rate against changeups and breaking balls and over his final 50 games produced an OPS of 870 against secondary offerings. So I mean, that, that's what you want to see. So you have, it might be a fringy hit tool, but you got an absolute burner. You have plus raw pop that he's starting to tap into more and more and a high probability of sticking in center field. You may have to shelter him from lefties. That's fine. I just think that this guy's too talented to not be in the top 100. Yeah. So Melton is a guy that like, obviously everybody really fell in love with during the draft process in 22. He had 17 homers. He was 21 for 22 in the stolen base department at Oregon state. He comes into the big leagues or he comes into professional baseball, the minor leagues, 23 games had an 820 OPS. Like he didn't really hit the ground running quite like some of these other draft guys where it's like, Oh, he has an 1100 at levels that are way too low for him. But 2023, I feel like we saw what Melton can be. And are there 45 bags at the big league level? Probably not. But you've got the potential for 25 homers and 25 stolen bases, which is really fun. My question for you is, do you think he can play center field or is this a right yeah. fielder? No, I, I really do think he can stick in center. And and that was the thing that put him, kind of solidified him for me is, is diving into that video. Uh, I, I, every time I saw him, he just did not get much action in center. And that's why I swear, like the video sometimes can just do you better, especially with the outfield, but it's also yeah. hard to get reads. Um, I, I know his first step's good and just seeing the way that he can read and track balls, both over his head, both gaps, the, the closing speed. I think he can, he can most definitely stick in center field and, and, and be at least average there. But I think there could be an above average glove there that takes a lot of pressure off of the bat. And that's why he's the top 100 guy for me. There is is there an yeah there's an opening i guess in center field in houston like that's one of the very few places that there's a legitimate opening at because they're probably not married to the idea of jake myers and now that jordan is playing dh full time you got Chaz and left like there is space to create for jacob melton he's probably not ready this year especially for a team that wants to win the world series but i i see you've got the 25 eta that could be like opening day 2025 yes. Yeah, he could be a September call up, you know, if somebody's banged up and they want to give him a little bit of run as they get ready for the playoffs or, you know, he could be a guy that ends up being a bench piece with with the speed and the stolen base ability that, you know, you, you probably don't hit much in the playoffs, but I could see him up at the end of the year. I do agree though. I think this is a guy that you want to kind of take it slow. He he has some unique moves in the box. He's still trying to work on mitigating some of that swing and miss and pitch rack. I'm I'm comfortable with him just kind of being a level each stop kind of guy. He's going to repeat double, I'd assume, this year. It's not even repeat. He got there at the end of the year yeah, and settled weeks. in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, he's going to get his second taste of double, probably finish the year in triple. Again, if they if they really need it, but I think Lil Profito is kind of there to be able to plug in, and yeah. they're not as much focused on Lil Profito's development because he's a little bit more polished, he's older, and he got a lot of run and showed great things in spring training. Another guy that I think you could have made the case could make the, the big league yeah. team. Uh, so, you know, I think Melton has – a, a, a nice path now where no one's really in his way, but he's not going to get rushed either. Yeah. 97 Ramon Ramirez, Kansas city Royals catcher who has only played at the DSL. He should be at the complex this year. Uh, I know Jack, you always you know, just say like, Oh, I don't have a ton to add on these types of guys, but we've talked about him a lot. I've sent you yeah. some video of him yeah. and, and you know, look, People are going to ask, oh, well, where's Yo Andre Vargas on this list and things like that. And, and we talk about how it's it's pretty tough to rank. I just don't love ranking DSL prospects in the top 100 because so much can change. And also, it's it's so early for them. Like 
there's guys that, with Vargas, any semi decent breaking ball slider he saw, it, it gave him trouble. So those are the things I'm kind of looking at is like, how much do you stand out from your peers in the areas that most players at that age and at that level struggle with Ramirez? It was on multiple fronts and he's the number one prospect for us in the Royal system. The, the field of hit was there. And we see that like there's some guys that have a really good field to hit on fastballs like Vargas of, of the Dodgers, but with Ramirez hits fastballs well, but then the way he's able to, to recognize spin, stay back on it, drive it the other way, the way that the barrel lives through the zone, the body control is really impressive. And then on top of that, like there's a lot of questions usually about defense with these guys, right? They're so young. It's so early. How does the body develop? Uh, we haven't really seen too much run from them at certain positions. Ramirez, the receiving's already pretty darn good. The arm is pretty good. He's blocking pretty well. He looks like he could very easily be an above average catcher. I don't have much concern about him sticking there. You're already seeing flashes of, of above average power for his age. I mean, at 17 years old, now 18, he was putting up exit velocities as high as 108. 90th percentile of 103. And again, just I don't like to dive too deep into the numbers, but when you're making contact in the zone at a 90% clip in those DSL games, that's already going to put you in a unique spot. And then being able to hit the secondaries, having such an advanced swing, the mechanics just were too good for me to not have him in here. Uh, I, I think he's going to be one of the big breakout guys this year. If, if he gets enough run at the complex, I, th I think he could end up you know, in low A and putting up some good numbers there too. So a lot of people that are reading this list are, yeah, are probably saying who, but they're also like, I've seen that name, but I've never watched this guy play. I haven't seen video. I haven't even seen a picture. And like you Google Ramon Ramirez Royals. I think there are two pictures and they're just the same <laughs> photo that are reframed. But what I'll tell you from like seeing the, the small video that you've sent is like physique wise, I'm not comparing production whatsoever, but physique wise, it's very similar to a young Francisco Alvarez where he's fire hydrant esque and like you can really get behind the fire hydrant kind of growing into his own because if he was like, you know, like 180 is probably selling him short. But yeah, I got to update that. There's no way he's 180. No, no, no. It's the 40 man signing weight, like that kind of thing. But he's strong. He's really strong. He's thick. Like there, there is a catcher there. You see that clearly. Some of these teenage catchers, like they're either way too big, like Duno, Alfredo Duno in Cincinnati, way too big, or they're like, you know, skinny kids that like look overwhelmed by putting the gear on. That's not the case with him. He looks like he was made to put the gear on. I, I think that's the perfect way to describe it. It's strong, but athletic. I don't think he's going to th like thicken out too much to, to be slow, but he's already really powerful. You look at the legs, really strong. I, I think he's that perfect balance and build that you want to see. And, you know, I think at the end of the year that he was playing a little bit at the complex, uh, they, they do these like additional games out there that like no one really knows about, which is kind of wild. And, you know, they, they send a lot of their top guys out there to get reps out and, and just continue to, to get more experience. And um, he showed out really well against some really talented arms as well. Those scrimmage, you know, Dodgers guys, things like that at, at the end of, of September and just, just more of the same where he just looked really good. Everything I heard was that he stood out and, I think this is going to be a guy that could easily be a consensus top 100 prospect by the end of the year, especially if the bats of ball continues to to progress, you know, or at least translate at some of these upper levels the way we've seen it. He's a little aggressive at times, and that's something that could, you know, catch up to him against better pitching. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I really like is he elevates consistently, and I think that's going to allow him to tap into his above average power, even if the hit tool trends close. Number 96, we got Ryan Clifford of the New York Mets traded from the Astros in that Justin Verlander trade plus 33 and a half million or whatever it was yeah. Clifford 11th round pick, but don't be misguided by that. He got $1.25 million roughly second round money uh, to sign because the Astros went so college heavy in 2022. You get a chance to see Clifford uh, in, in the spring breakout game, Jack, you could see how physical he was. Mm -hmm. I know that most of your attention was steered towards his blue glove, uh, but <laughs> We also saw him on the backfields absolutely lace a couple baseballs. It's a really simple operation in the box, uh, and, and I think that allows him to, to make more contact than most 6'3", 210, 220-pound, you know, big left-handed young hitters. And it, look, the, the power could easily be 30-plus homers. I think the hit tool is, is fringy, and the approach is going to need to continue to develop to, to hedge that hit tool. And also, we, we, we don't know where he's going to play defensively. He's split time between outfield and, and first base. 
he's got a hose for an like it, it's it's arguably a double plus arm. So I think the, the the goal is that he can translate to right field, but there's a chance he ends up at first. Even if he does end up at first, which is where I think his long term home probably is, the bat is just too exciting and the numbers were just too good. Twenty four home runs in his age nineteen season. Uh, there's just so much to be excited about here offensively, and that's why the Mets targeted him. So number one, I am distracted by colors and sounds. I'm like a dog. Like mm-hmm. you show me a bright blue glove. I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch the glove. I'm not going to watch baseball anymore. <laughs> number two, he is one of three um, lefty mashers with tons of defensive questions that we are going to talk about in this group of 15. <laughs> which and, is why they're here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is like why they're in the 186 range. Um, and Clifford is one of the three best lefty mashers with defensive questions in the minor leagues, age appropriate. Like they're all 19 years old. Clifford's 20. 19 to 20. Clifford just turned 20. Yeah. He just turned 20. So like they're either 19 or a young 20, all of them. And like they have time to try and figure out right field and how to be somewhat passable there. Um, obviously best case scenario, like you just mentioned is, is he learns how to play right field because he's got a cannon. But at the end of the day, like it's all on the bat. It's all on the homer output, and you see 30 homers from a guy that just turned 20 years old. He's a top 100 prospect. 90th percentile of 107. I mean, yeah. it's just you know, a big it. time impact. He's only going to get more physical too. Like he, he's not, it's, he's not maxed out. Uh, and and we got to see him really up close and personal on the backfields. I just continue to be impressed with how he repeats his moves. It's really simple in the box too. It's really just an inward coil into the back hip, minimal stride, and does a ton of damage just off of those simple moves like quiet moves with loud impact. I'm always going to be excited. about. 95, a reliever, probably the only like guaranteed reliever really we'll see on this list. Uh, but Mason Miller checks in from the Oakland A's. I mean, th- this guy, when, when he got an 80 fastball and he's been on our top 100 list and he was a guy that we had on, I think kind of before the, the, the big time breakout, one yeah. of my favorite guests on the show too, uh, just telling his story, how unique it was, but I, the A's moving him to the bullpen. I love it. I mean, he has really struggled to stay healthy. And now you move him to the bullpen where I think he should have an easier time doing so. The fastball is now just sitting 101, 102. It's, he's just going to overpower guys. But then he also has a wipeout slider, home mix and a cutter. I, I think there's less importance now on the changeup. And he can just overpower you with the fastball and the slider and the occasional cutter. I think he can be one of the best closers in Major League Baseball this year if he stays healthy. And that, that's a top 100 prospect. Mason Miller, the closer. You don't leave an 80 grade fastball off of the top 100. And you can't. This, yeah. And this is where the 80 grade fastball from a closer slots into the top 100. Um, my lofty hot take is he throws a fastball 105 miles an hour within the next two years. Mm. I would love that. I would love that. I think it's very possible because again, he has not really been continuously healthy. He's been working back from injury, and then and we've still seen 103 when he's not continuously yep. healthy. I we that get would be a blast. we get 105 from Mason Miller next two years. Book it. He's been lights out in spring training too. Has he been one of your favorite spring training watches? I think so. Um, it's happening in like the middle innings of Oakland A's games, so it's been tough to you know really stay dialed until it's no. Just go back season. though, see the highlights. Yeah. I still count that as a spring training watch for sure. He's going to be one of those guys where it's like you know late night West Coast. I want to go to bed a little bit earlier. I'll wake up the next day and I will click on that game and I'll just go mm-hmm. watch the ninth inning if I saw that he threw because like this guy, it's it's almost globe trotter ish. Yeah. Where it's like you go to see the show. And his fastball is the show in Oakland this year. A hundred percent. Average is 101 miles an hour on the fastball. And so far this spring, he's striking out 41% of batters. It's 11 punchies in 27 plate appearances. It's going to be more of the same. He might not have a ton of save opportunities, but when he gets a chance, I think he's going to nail him down uh, at a pretty high rate. Number 94 is another pitcher and a guy that we talked about after, you know, the spring breakout game, Tink Hentz right-handed pitcher in the St. Louis Cardinals organization. Uh, I got to fix that. It just says weight, not the height, <laughs> but uh, I, look, this guy's, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster the last year and a half. I think it's been hard to differentiate what's been maybe health versus command versus stuff. Maybe not translating because he's being stretched out more. He's been one of the more difficult players to assess because he's, he was you know, babied 
which is fine he, he, with the injury concerns and you know with him being a prep arm, but we didn't really see him stretched out and or challenged. So he just dominated low A, probably longer than he needed to. And then as we finally started to see him get stretched out, some injuries crept in. Did that have anything to do with him being stretched out? Maybe not. It could have just been fluky. Some of the injuries were fluky, but then he comes back. There was some talk about maybe a finger issue affecting him, uh, and and that may have impacted the command some. So he's just been a really tough read. That said, the last few times we've been able to see him, he's looked more like the Tink Hens we saw in, in 21, and where the fastballs jump in, everything kind of tunnels from that uh, over-the-top release. The slider looks really good. The changeup looks good. It seems like that fastball slider changeup is going to give him a legitimate three-pitch mix that can make him a mid-rotation starter. The question is the command and health. And those are two things that we're just going to have to wait and see. You just bet on the young athlete figuring it out, especially when he's flashed what he has flashed already at this point. And the, and the fact that you could get a 60 fastball slider and changeup shows you that he can do both with his hand. And that's another testament to his athleticism. Um, I don't know. And you like you watch the delivery too. You're enamored with what that could turn into if he just, you know, continues to fill out. And obviously he's been working hard in the weight room, but even two more years in in a professional weight program. And it's like, hey, let's get you eating the right things. Let's get you doing the right exercises. What can that turn into? And I think it can turn into somebody that is small in stature, yes, but electric stuff out of the hand, like kind of like what we've seen from Jared Jones, right? Absolutely. And, and here's just an example of how difficult he is to assess. I mean, in the span of, of a month and a half last year, we saw him average 98.5 in a start, and that was a five-inning start. He averaged 98.5 miles an hour on his fastball. And then a handful of starts later, we saw him average 92 on the so fastball. Like, but then but two starts after that, he's averaging 95.5. So, so it, it just the fluctuations were tough. Yeah, 98 Tink Hens is a top 50 prospect in baseball, probably. 92 oh, yeah. Tink Hens is well outside the top 100. So yes. where does like the middle ground Tink Hens sit? And the answer is right now is in the mid-90s. Because the shape, I think it's a great point. The shape is kind of average, but from that release in the mid to upper 90s, it will be a plus heater. In the low 90s, it's going to be an average heater. So that's that's an aspect of it. And also, I really do think his fastball sets the tone for everything else, right? When you have to worry about that over-the-top heater, and then you've got the changeup and the slider that looks just like it out of the hand and then cuts in on you if you're a lefty or dives away from you if you're a righty, the fastball really sets that all up and, and makes a big difference. Yeah. Another Cardinal. We stack them here unintentionally, but it's just they're, they're so they're so close in terms of value. And I think even Cardinals officials would tell you the same thing. TK Roby, this guy, like, again, it, there's been spurts where I see him and it's like, holy crap, he, this guy is nasty. And then there's been spurts where it's like, okay, there's a lot of fastball reliance here. Um, you know, is the command going to be there? And, and, and some other you know, questions. At the end of the day, the fastball is really good. At least I think it flashes plus, but it, it's closer to above average. The, the flat VAA, I think maybe it helps it play up closer to plus. The downer curveball off of that, it, it's a tunneling nightmare. Right. But he's trying to figure out which between the slider and the changeup are going to kind of make that leap for him as the third pitch. And the command's still a work in progress. Another guy that has struggled to stay healthy, when he is healthy, we see him really start to get these nice stretches going and then maybe has a flare up and that limits him some. But I do think this fastball could tick closer to plus. If you have the plus fastball curveball, good chance he's at least a good reliever. But I do feel like the Cardinals are, are hoping he can be closer to a three starter. I think he settles in somewhere as like a four starter. Uh, if that command can get closer to average curveball, 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 that that's the one like when, when his curveball is right, when the overall command is there, that thing is like impossible to touch. But I think that thing is, I think the fastball curveball combination is almost like depleted in value when his command is not right. And, and then it turns into not a nibble act, but you know, more of like a timid approach, I guess, to to facing a lineup, especially as he kind of climbed levels. But when he's got fastball curveball working and he can go fastball at the top of the zone from that flat angle that you're talking about, and then the curveball, you mentioned how it works off of that. Like again, the north south thing. It's a really yeah. good north south combination. Which is, uh, to your point, 100% the reason why he racked up a 33 percent chase rate on his fastball and a 33 percent chase rate on his curveball because you start uh, guessing vertically you can either guess horizontally or vertically and he's a vertical guy it's actually harder to guess vertical yeah 100 percent, and that's been the problem 
I mean, if, if he can find that third pitch and or just get the curveball command to the point where he can just lean on it heavily, I, I think we'll see a little bit, you know, more more of that starters profile to him. But right now it was, you know, 55% fastball last year. He commanded the fastball really well, but the rest of his arsenal, I mean, we're looking at sub 60% strike rate, actually well below, yeah, f- f- not well below, but 57% strike rate on all of his secondaries. It, it's got to be better than that to reach that mid rotation upside, but still really like the talent here, a great get by the Cardinals in the Jordan yes. Montgomery swap as well, alongside yeah. Thomas Ajay-Z, who we're a couple days away from talking about here on the show. Yeah. 92, another recently traded player. This is kind of like the trade range here too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Another player that we've got to see one last good live look at uh, on the backfield. Some a few times in the final week, you know, here before before we put out this episode, but or put out the list. But Luis Angel Acuna, shortstop, New York Mets. He's small. I think you know when you get to the backfields, you can really see like the 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 frame of guys a lot better and old and everything. But he he can pack a little bit more of a punch than I think he gets credit for. Uh, the swing looks a lot like his brother, which I honestly don't love. Because that his brother's sw- Ronald Acuna's swing is not something you really duplicate. Like it is really hard to do. You got to be a freakazoid and extremely powerful to create that much whip from that hand position and the barrel turn and still create that that much bat speed. That said, Acuna's gotten Luis Angel Acuna has gotten better and better with that, um, and we've seen more impact. Uh, I think we we've seen a little bit of a subtle adjustment to him being his own version of his brother's swing, and you know I, I, we've seen him elevate more. We've seen him start to hit the ball harder. We've seen better swing decisions. And that was another reason why he was one of the, the, the key pieces that the Mets targeted here. What makes him a top 100 prospect for me is elite stolen base skills. I mean, he's going to be up there with just about anybody with his ability to swipe bags. I know the Mets don't need a shortstop, but we're talking about this when we were at the spring breakout game. The, the misconception is, I think people hear Luis Angel Acuna is going to have to move from shortstop because of that Lindor guy there. And they take it as, oh, he might not be the best shortstop. He is a good shortstop. I think he, he, he might be a borderline plus shortstop. Yeah. He might have to play second where he'd be elite. Maybe he plays some center. We've seen some action there. I think he's a super utility type that can play really good defense at a lot of different spots. Haven't seen enough run in center field to have an idea, but I'd imagine he could get pretty good there pretty quick with his speed and just the instincts he has for the game. Above average hit, it's going to be fringy power, but he hits it hard enough to split the gaps and I think mix in some homers. Going to steal a lot of bags, can play good defense at shortstop or at multiple spots. Top 100 prospect. Yes. So Ronald's swing is very flat, right? Yes. Like the the way he pumps balls out, the way he hit 40 last year is by hitting balls 121.3 miles an you hour. You are spot on. Yeah. So, you know, like when he was hurt, right? Like when he was coming back from that from that ACL tear, it was like a 60% ground ball rate. Yep. So that's probably the issue. And hey, if there's anybody in the world that can replicate Ronald Acuna Jr. swing, it's probably little brother because yes. they came from the same set of parents. Um, so like I, I'm not discounting him because of that swing. It's just there are a lot of ways that that swing can go wrong, especially if you don't hit the ball 121 miles an hour. And this is that guy. But if he can tweak it just enough to be unique to Louie, where he can start going gap to gap and he can elevate just a little bit more, that is where he unlocks that new level of offensive value. He's never going to be a 25 homer guy, but he can be a guy that can have 30 doubles in a given season because Mm -hmm. he hits the ball hard enough from a swing that stays in the zone for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And if you make it just a little bit less flat, that, that unlocks a new world, I think. I, I think you nailed it. I, I 100% agree with that. And, and I think he's trending in that direction, right? You're not going to do it overnight, but we saw uh, the biggest thing was he was a drifter too, like weight on the front foot. And again, another thing, if you have freak bat speed, you can get away with that premature forward move. If you're not a freakazoid, it's a little bit harder. He had, he had an OPS of 599 against fastballs 94 plus in 2022. And then in 2023, he upped that to, to 763. That's it's awesome. a big difference. It's a yeah. big difference. jump in contact rate, cut the ground ball rate by 5%. So it seems like he's already starting to make that adjustment that you you just alluded to, Jack. Yeah. 91 is another Jack McMullen special. All right. This is another top prospect sponsored by Jack McMullen. Lazaro Montes checks in at number 91, Seattle Mariners prospect. Is it fair to say that this is like one of your favorite prospects in baseball? Yes, because he's he's hilarious uh, in the sense of 
take all the defensive concerns for Ryan Clifford and blow them up, but take the power for Ryan Clifford and blow them up. Yep. It's, it's amazing. Like he's, he's a 19 year old that, I mean, you've got on the defensive write up, like gonna be a DH. So you have a 19 year old DH that hit the ball 118 miles an hour when he was 18, like alien. What, what you did to sell me on, on Lazaro was, you know, I, I think the defensive limitations, I mean, and, and that's generous. I mean, I watched the, the, the defensive video. I felt like I needed a seatbelt you know, to, yeah. to just to watch that. But the, the fake, he was faking Deeks, which were hilarious. He just, oh, he, yeah. he's charismatic dude. And I, I know that doesn't matter here, but like, he's going to be a guy that if, if he turns into the player that I think people can hope that he can be and, and the power continues to translate, he's going to be a fan favorite. He is funny as hell. I love the way that he plays the game and he has fun out there, which is, which is awesome. But I got very caught up in the swing and miss because there is, there's plenty of in zone swing and miss and, and the defensive limitations. But you pointed out, the production and how rare it has been to see from an 18 year old. Uh, really, we haven't really seen many guys at all. And if you look at the list of players that have put up the numbers that he has put up at the levels that he put it up at, at his age, it's a short list of guys who have had a ton of success in the major leagues. So that aspect of it is, is important. Uh, the, the, the power is unteachable. 118.4 mile per hour max at 18 years old is a joke. His 90th percentile is, you know, I think the highest of any 19, 18, 19 year old, you know, in, in, in minor league baseball last year. And look, the swing is good. Like, it, I, th I think it's just a matter of length and he's going to continue to just get better at, at making consistent contact, but uh, at more, more consistent contact, but he can get away with, with below average contact rates with how hard he hits the baseball. As long as he can continue to improve the approach, he's not Jordan Alvarez. And I know that he trains with Jordan Alvarez's coach. That's good because it's going to help him, you know, yes. in terms of, it, there's not a lot of coaches that know how to work with a Lazaro Montes or Jordan Alvarez type. You know but, what he's, you know what that's going to do? It's going to help him attack and pounce on pitches in each quadrant of the strike zone. Like yeah. it's going to help him feel more comfortable impacting every ball in all four quadrants. Is he going to do it to the level that Jordan can? No, no. that's gift from God stuff yeah. for Jordan. Yeah. He's a plus hitter. Yeah, like Montes has gift from God stuff in a different way. It's not the hit tool gift from God that Jordan has. It's the you can run into it and produce a sound and make a ball go farther than really anybody else on the planet can. Without being Josh Mears. So like yeah. it's still a testament to his bat to ball. Like for how powerful he is at his age, it is impressive bat to ball. But Jordan is like, I don't know if people totally realize like how rare Jordan is. Like in terms of the power hit combination, it's I, once in a lifetime. It's it really is. It really, really is. So that said, Montes, I mean, it's 40 home run upside. And I, the second I thought about that, I'm like, how many home runs can this guy feasibly hit? And the answer was 40. You know, if, if he hits enough, that guy's got to be in the top 100, no, yes. no matter what his de defensive position is, even if there is no defensive position. So I, I, he's top of my list of guys I'm excited to watch this year, by the way, too. And I will say patient, not passive is another pro for Montes. Yes. And I think he can continue to be more patient. I think he will because he's going to realize like that's the that's the best thing he can do for himself. But yeah, not passive. He he wants to let it eat. And he can also hit pitches out of the zone, which is important too, because uh, he can do damage even when he makes a maybe a, a bad swing decision or not a great swing decision. He can still really pummel a baseball, which is which is huge. Number 90. Addison Barger. Oh, it even came with a gif. Uh, if there's one player I wanted to have a gif, it's probably him just with his <laughs> swing. Uh, Addison Barger, the Toronto Blue Jays. We talked about him recently in the Blue Jays system. This is not uh, sponsored by me pick. Um, yeah. But this is a guy that I, I just I think we're probably the only people that have him in a top 100 list going into this year. So this is kind of just like calling our shot here. I just think he's gonna have a, a huge year in AAA. And I don't know where he fits in on the big league level, but I think they'll find a spot, especially if IKF is uh, IKFing. But Barger. Look, we talked about it on the episode, dealt with an elbow issue. He even talked about how he felt as though that elbow issue impacted him more at the plate than actually throwing. Then I really fell in love with the aspect of he can play third at a decent level, but also can play right field at a pretty good level. So if you're going to be an average defender, be an, and you, but you can be an average defender at two spots, that's great. Hits left on left well, just pummels baseballs, dude. Like he just hits the crap out of baseballs. and you see a swing with a lot of moving parts and a lot of violence yet he makes a fair amount of contact. So the improvements he made bat to ball wise, the power that we know is there, the ability to now play right field at a decent level. 
I know it was a down year, but I thought he did a lot of things last year that really helped solidify the foundation of his profile. And now I think it's just a matter of elevating more. And I think he's going to do that this year. I mean, there's a lot of upside here and a guy that doesn't need to be protected from lefties and who can keep himself in the lineup by playing third. You could put him at short in an emergency. He's not a disaster there. He can play right. I'm sure you could throw him at second if you wanted to, but he might throw the ball through the first baseman's head with his right. plus plus arm. Yeah, no, I mean, he, um, I will say that there is so much ferocity in his hips. Like, not often do you talk about a guy's hips because, like, it, it's all just one fluid motion, right? But hips are very important to hitters. This is one of the few guys that I think the casual fan can see. Look how quickly he fires his hips. Like, that dude is turning and the bat follows with so much of a vicious feel. And, like, yeah, it took you selling me. <laughs> for me to like accept that he was a top 100 guy but you know what like really was the nail in the coffin was the spring breakout game like he had That's a couple of balls where he hit incredibly hard and the sound of the bat was incredibly loud and it's like okay how many guys in minor league baseball are you getting this sound from and that result from and the answer is not many yeah I, I love the point you bring up about the rotational explosion a lot of guys that have that rotational power can get spinny mm-hmm I want to, I want to do damage and I'm a rotational guy. Okay. I really want to hit the ball. I'm going to leave it right. I'm going to pull off because that's how I, that's how I pack a punch his path and the way that he's able to enter the, the, the zone so deep. If you can see the gift too on, on, on YouTube, but if you look at an Aston Barger swing, he enters the zone so early and he's able to have so much like separation from, you know, his front side and his backside to where it, it, the bat just stays in the zone forever. He doesn't get spinny even when he's getting his his A plus swing off, which he gets off a ton. I, again, I just I just think that this bat's too good. The improvements bat to ball wise. Uh, I, I'm another guy that I am amped to see this year. I think he's going to launch balls in Buffalo this season and be back on people's top 100 lists. I love it. 89. Bryce Eldridge, the outfielder, not the two-way player anymore, uh, of the San Francisco Giants. And it was tough to try to peg where he should be. Uh, also, I did notice, for those who are watching on YouTube, I do need to update a couple of the plate discipline grades on some of those other ones. I will fix that. Uh, but Bryce Eldridge, six foot seven. I'm, I, I like that they're focusing on the, on the offensive side of things for him because this guy can get up to the big leagues a lot quicker if he's not worrying about pitching. I did like him as a pitcher, and I did think he, has, he had a legitimate chance of being a two-way guy. But you have a six, seven guy who's way more advanced than any, it's a very rare profile, but way more advanced than most hitters that are that tall and prep guys, right? Like the bats of balls better than a lot of guys you'll see with, with that kind of build. The approach is, is really good. Uh, he, he drew plenty of walks, has a good feel for the zone. He's already run into some big time EVs. He hit one on the backfields, 111 off of Shota Imanaga. It was a terrible pitch. It was a hanger way up and he pulverized it. But there, there's some swing and miss because of the long levers. And I, that's my one concern here is a spin. I could see him having that O'Neill Cruz type of like swinging over it frustratingly. But I think he has a little bit more body control at this stage than, than, than Cruz did at, at in spurts. What's the defensive home? It, it, he has a, a cannon for an arm as well, similar to Clifford. But he does not look great out there just yet. He split time too between outfield and first base a little bit. I, I think he could end up at first base, but the bat is just so good. Uh, and or in and projectable that you know th that's what makes him a, a notable prospect. But if he can play right field, and I think there's a chance he could play a passable right field, then that really helps him too. Where do you feel like he hits the snag? Like, hey, he's playing, you know, low A ball on April 5th. Is it elevated heaters? He's too long to get him right now at 19 years old. Like where where does the adjustment need to come if you were going to look into your crystal ball? That's a great question. Um and you know that stuff can be difficult to to peg sometimes i think it, i think there's a little bit of of concern about you know yeah like so many young hitters is that that ride up but th that's pretty hard hard for anybody i think more for me is is can he stay on those breaking balls or do you have that you know you can close your eyes and picture that o'neill cruz and, and ellie yeah. dilla cruz waving over those breaking balls where they just really never had a shot so that's a little bit of a combination of pitch recognition, but also, you know, can you control your body even when you're fooled enough to be able to stay behind the baseball? And a lot of these six, seven guys, long levers, when they're a little bit fooled and that breaking ball is coming, they just have no way to be able to adjust and, and get a better swing off on those. So I'm more concerned about him getting spun to death, I think, you know, with, with his big body and, and the long levers, because he has shown the ability to be compact to the baseball and, cool. and, and be pretty efficient. Love it. 
will go to number 88. And now this is another Jack McMullen favorite. Dylan Head, outfielder of the San Diego Padres. We were worried that he may be on the move in that mm -hmm. trade. You know, when we looked at Dylan Cease going over to the Padres because Dylan Head, Chicago land kid, really talented. Uh, I know that the, the reports were that with the White Sox were in on him. You'd hope so, being that he was in their own backyard. But um, I think the Padres really like what they've got here with Head, and you know, they would rather move Iriarte, who we'll get to, you know, not too long from now, and and, and also um, Drew Thorpe, who they just added, who we'll get to in a couple yeah. episodes. But Dylan Head, what, what I love about him is you can see the potential for plus hit. You got elite run times. You get the ability to be a great center fielder, and then beyond that, like. There's more thump there, I think, than most players with this profile. He's already flashed some decent EVs, and he's going to get more physical. That's what really puts him over the top for me is there's a lot, again, a lot more thump than you'd expect from this type of speed and contact profile. Yeah, you know, the one thing for me is like, okay, so you've got 45 present, 60 future on the hit tool. How quickly does that develop? And frankly, I would have been worried if he was actually part of that deal because the White Sox – how good are they at, at developing young guys? Like, I don't know how much of that was already given with Colson Montgomery versus, you know, what have they nurtured in Colson Montgomery? I think Colson was probably a, a more advanced hitter than Dylan had at this point. Yeah. I but mean, he's just, was, he's just special, right? He's just special. And like, there's a reason we're going to talk about him, like maybe even next week. Right. But head, I would, I would be worried if he wasn't in the right organization. He's in the right organization. And this is the organization where the freak athletes come to feast. And, you know, like I do think that there's a way, yeah, he could grow into more power. But, but the hit tool for me kind of turns into the end-all be-all. And I feel like this is the right organization to foster that hit tool blossoming to a 60. I mean, look at Jackson Merrill. Every time I there's a draft cycle and there's a swing that I love, I feel like the Padres take that guy. Or I – I haven't seen a ton of the Padres pick. I watch and I'm like, I love this guy's swing. Yeah. It's going to translate. And and Dylan Head's another one where just the swing is so advanced for his age. He's going to be, I think the floor is is higher than most prep bats that you're going to see. And then again, there is enough thump there. I, and I love the situation for him too, as you mentioned. Uh, this is a guy that I think will have a lot of helium this year. And the approach being good too, he should, I think, make a pretty smooth transition into you know more of a full, his first full pro season. And you know, yeah, there might be some some pitch recognition things here and there with spin, but uh, that's like to be expected from any young prepster, especially cold weather kid too. So there, real quick, there are very few organizations that you can view as like tiebreakers. If you yes. like a prospect the exact same, the the organizations just off the top of my head that you can truly view as a tiebreaker, and it's like, okay, this guy's in one of those organizations, this guy is not. I'm going to take the guy in the organization that I deem a tiebreaker. The Padres are a tiebreaker. The Dodgers are a tiebreaker. Um, I think Tampa for pitching is a tiebreaker. Who else? Guardians for pitching. Guardians for pitching. How about Yankees for pitching at this point? Yeah, the Yankees program they've got going on right now. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm subscribing to that too. Uh, but yeah, I agree. There's just a few. Well, that'd be a great episode we should do one of these days. Yeah, who are the tie-breaking organization? <laughs> and, and what do they excel at? I think would yeah. be a lot of fun, but I'm with you. I think that's a, it's a great point. 87, Anthony Solometo, Solomito. Anthony mm -hmm. Solomito. I always want to say Solomito. I don't know why. Left-handed pitching prospect, Pittsburgh Pirates. A guy that I, you should see by the end of this year. I think so. I think maybe even by the, this, the mid part of the season. What, what really sold me on him, you have a funky lefty with a good fastball, nasty slider, change-ups a work in progress, but he also has variations of the fastball, one with a little bit more ride, one with more you know run and gets a ton of ground balls. He gets early weak contact but misses enough bats. The extension is fantastic, and, and he, he gets kind of reverse splits, which is, which is great because – you know, you're going to see more righties and, and lefties are naturally going to be uncomfortable against him anyway. So that was the one concern. I'm like, okay, fastball slider. How does he get righties out? But because of the funky release, righties have to wait even longer to see the baseball. So that that helps him, I think, really have his stuff play up. Uh, it, it, the tick up in velocity was pretty much all he needed to, to really hit that next step because he's so funky. And so now it just seems like it's combining to, to make hitters extremely uncomfortable. And at 21 years old, he was 20 years old last year. He just carved through high A, then put up some pretty good numbers in double A. And what stood out to me too was he kind of ran out of gas at the end of the year, eclipsed, you know, the, the highest innings total we've seen from him. And even with his velocity, 
down from 92, 93 to more 89, 90, he was still getting outs and still effective. So knowing now that I'm assuming he's going to be back closer to 92, 93, maybe even 94, he's going to be able to get guys out just consistently. He's still only 21. I just feel like it's a good balance of floor and ceiling. If that changeup can come along, though, then you know, he could be a problem. Yeah, I feel like I'm not allowed to say this anymore because we've seen Garrett Cole and Sandy Alcantara go down recently with elbow issues, but he has the build to shoulder a heavy workload. And like, I, again, I'm probably done saying that about pitchers, but I would say that about Skeens. I would say that about Robbie Snelling. And I'm going to say it about Solomito. Like he's much bigger than you would expect when you watch him on, on television, but he's six, five and you know, he pitches using the entirety of his weight, moving down the hill with that unorthodox delivery. Yeah, I, again, I don't want to anatomically break down like what he does, but it feels like it's easy on the elbow. And having said that, like he's probably going to have elbow issues because all these pitchers have elbow issues. It just sucks. It sucks. It, but like his delivery and his build do scream durability. It does scream innings eater and, and, and his, his arsenal screams innings eater because yeah. he pounds his own his last 15 appearances or starts 24% K rate, 6% walk rate, filling up the zone. But what I love is he has the four seamer that gets him a little bit more whiff. And then he has more of that sinker that gets him a lot of early week contact, which allows him to, to pick up ground balls, 56% ground ball rate in that stretch with that pitch. And then of course that slider, he commands the living crap out of like, that was what also stood out to me too, is, you know, over his final 15 starts, Talking about a guy that landed his slider for a strike 73% of the time from that release point, that's absolutely crazy. So really impressive stuff. I think he's going to continue to build on that this year, especially if the velocity you know holds up there. Uh, I, I think you're going to have another guy that just is a fast riser and, and another big name pitching-wise in this Pirate system. Love it. Last but not least, Detroit Tigers, Kevin McGonigal. This is just one of my favorite underrated lower level hit tool guys. He was a comp A pick 37th overall by, by the Tigers using those savings with Max Clark to, to, to go get McGonagall. And, and that's what I think justifies the pick because uh, at least a little bit because of just how safe he is McGonagall. I, I think this is a potential better than plus hit tool in terms of just how advanced he is bat to ball wise. It, it's, it's remarkable. He's, he's a little bit more compact, but he, he moves so well in the box. As I think as good of a feel for the barrel as just about anybody, maybe any prep bat in that class last year. Unbelievable approach already. Great pitch recognition skills. Hits lefties. Sprays the ball over the field. And can still sneak some, some impact in there too. I do think there's a potential for 10, maybe even 15 home runs. So the other side is, oh, well, does he stick it short? I actually don't think he's bad at short. It will, he might ultimately move to second base where he'd be a really solid defender. But I think he's passable at short right now. That he moved his feet pretty well. The arm was good enough. Good instincts. If he can stick it short, then he's really going to climb quickly in terms of, of prospect status. But when you have a better than plus hit tool, you have a you have plus plate discipline. And that's, I think, did we talk about that on the front the top? We probably didn't even talk about it. But no more raw power. We're talking plate discipline and hit yeah. tool. And, and we'll explain that more in the next episode. But, you know, I, I thought present game power and future game power was kind of, you know, taking care of the raw power side. I thought it kind of made it redundant. So, and I felt like hit tool kind of gets undermined a little bit because you could have a guy that has phenomenal bat to ball skills and a brutal approach, right. and he might not hit for a great average, but he is good bat to ball. The plate discipline undermines it. I wanted to be able to illustrate that a little bit better. But when you have a guy like Kevin McGonigal, who's potential 60 hit, both. and yeah. then you already have plus plate discipline, I feel even more confident in his ability to hit for average and get on base above average runner. It's really hard to poke a hole in this guy's game. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, he has yet to be blown up in like any video that I've seen of him. And you've probably watched every single one of his professional ABs and as many showcase ABs as, as you've seen, whether it be like, you know, with team USA in any capacity or any like perfect game showcase where he's seeing a first round type talent, he's never looked overmatched. He's never looked like a teenager. And that is insane. And I know that you have in here that, you know, he has excelled against elite competition on the summer circuit. Um, and that's important, man, especially with like these Northeast high school kids. You just never know what they can do, but we 100%. have an idea and it's exciting. And, and I think we saw flashes of enough impact there too. It's definitely, definitely gap to gap, which is enough. But then I think there's even more there. I, I love that you brought up that point. Cause I'm pretty sure I wrote even somewhere in there where 
I think I you watched every single at bat. Yeah, and I was like, you'd be hard pressed to find a bad at bat. I didn't really, even really. Yeah, you struck out a couple times, but I didn't really see one bad at bat throughout like the, his entire pro debut. And it's been more of the same in backfield stuff and, and everything I've heard from the a few within the Tigers organization. Like they're they're gushing over this guy, and I, I think he's going to be another guy that's consensus top 100 by the mid, middle of the season because of how good the bat to ball is, how good the approach is, enough impact. We'll see where the defensive home is, but even then. I still think that the, the, the bat to ball is just going to carry him there with, with some sneaky athleticism too. Nice. That'll do it for this episode. We are going to be kind of just chunking through these 15 at a time. And I'm really excited to do that. So stay tuned and we'll, we'll be done by you know the end of next week going through each of these. Uh, I will try to do a, you know, some, some Q and a stuff and, and answer any questions that you have. We'll probably do a mailbag after the top 100 comes out to, you know, just, do a top 100 theme or sorry after we're done with all these episodes yeah. to do like a top 100 themed mailbag answer your questions as they pertain to the list uh but also a reminder that you know we're really excited about the uh subscription stuff that we have going on with the bonus subscription episode every weekend as well or early in the week as well it's either going to be on the weekend or monday tuesday most of the time it'll be going out on the weekend where we'll be doing mailbags where we guarantee any subscribers uh will get their questions answered and then the other three bonus episodes every month will be Heat sheets, keeping you up with what's going on in the minor leagues, data, standouts, everything you need to know, and just keeping you up to date on just about everything. So really excited about that, but more excited now to just continue to churn through this top 100 list. Thank you so much for listening. As always, look forward to continuing to fly through this with you as we progress through this week and next week. And we look forward to talking prospects with you on Wednesday.